Hey AP Psych students, it is Megan here with Fiveable, and we are about to start our final free review of the year. Um, so just as a refresher, today we are reviewing semester two-ish stuff, basically things we haven't gotten to yet the last two review sessions that we've done. And then as a further reminder, Today is our last free review session, and so if you're wanting to take part in any of these other upcoming reviews, tomorrow night we're going to do some multiple choice questions. That's at um, 10 o'clock Eastern, 9 o'clock. Actually, that time might be wrong. I apologize. I believe it's 9 o'clock Eastern, 8 o'clock Central Time. So um, put those into your calendar. And all you have to do is join Fiveable Plus. Um, there's $5 membership options. And if you make that, um, if you pay that fee and, and join Fiveable Plus, you will be available to get all of these extra review sessions that are coming up. And again, I think the time I have posted there is incorrect. It's not 10, 10 p.m. Eastern. It's 9 p.m. Eastern, 8 p.m. Central. All right. So. As we've been doing, um, if you have any questions, basically I'm just going to do a really big overview of each unit, what like the specific things you should be focusing on for studying. And you can put questions to each other in the chat there on the right hand side. That would be great. Otherwise, if you have content related questions for me, you have a poll or not a poll and ask a question tab at the bottom of your screen. Um, you can just click in there. Um, and basically you can put your questions in there and I will answer them. I kind of try to do my slide and then answer as many questions as I want. Um, and so, yep, we're going to go over some theories today. So that will help answer some of the questions I'm seeing in the chat. And then there is a question that I'm seeing here. Um, we're going to be here for about an hour today. Um, actually I should just say maximum an hour. So. Um, if we get through everything before then, then we'll end the session. But if you guys have questions and stuff and it lasts for an hour, we will be there. Um, and then Dara is asking um, a test question. It says that someone um, said that there's a stats FRQ every two years and that there will be one this year. Um, there is a pattern. It's not anything that College Board necessarily says that, oh, there has to be an FRQ question. Um, every two years, but we do tend to see research-based or stats-based FRQ questions pretty regularly. Um, so I, I can't say that there will for sure be one, um, but chances are that more than any other topic, the FRQs do often focus on like research methods or statistics. So I would say that that's a good chance that there could be one, but there's no guarantee. Like we don't know for sure until we actually see the questions. All right, so the first chunk then that I had for review, we haven't gotten to cognition yet when we've been doing these reviews. Um, and so the cognition unit is big and there's a lot of information in it. I've tried to highlight the main um, the main thinkers, the main people behind it. Um, and so for the memory part of cognition, you need to make sure you understand the whole process um, that goes with memory. So from the sensory info coming in, how we encode that memory, working slash short-term memory, how we process that information, and then our various forms of long-term memory, explicit versus implicit, how we use retrieval cues to get that information, those sorts of things. And then as far as the other stuff, forgetting then is also a big part. And so there's two main ways that we forget or are unable to process information, and that's through interference and amnesia. And so I do see a question in here that relates to this already. Um, Rhea is asking, what is the difference between anterograde and retrograde amnesia? Antrograde amnesia is you have lost the ability to form new memories. So you've retained anything that you had previously already had. This would typically be like maybe like a brain injury or things like that. Um, so you didn't lose old memories. You still have those. But basically, it's almost like that movie. Um, 
50 first dates, if you've seen that, every day like you wake up and you don't remember the day before because you haven't processed those new memories. Retrograde amnesia is when you've lost all of your old memories. So again, brain injury, something like that, you maybe have lost everything old. I think of it with this one, retro, like clothes that are retro are kind of old school. Um, and so retrograde amnesia is you've lost old memories. So hopefully that helps. Um, also, it might help anterograde starts with an A. A is like the first letter of the alphabet. And to me, that's like new. A is first, new, that sort of thing. Maybe that'll help um, in remembering that. Okay. Um, other questions in the chat? Um, Someone's asking to send links to my notes from the this session and the previous session. I can do that. If you give me a second later on, I will do that. Just remind me a little bit later and I will send the notes. Um, and then for interference, we have proactive and retroactive. I'm not sure if your teachers use this, but I use like PORN, P-O-R-N, as an acronym to help me remember about interference. Um, so proactive is the P in PORN. And proactive interference is when old, that's the O, old information interferes with the learning or remembering of new information. And then retroactive interference, that's the R, is when new information, that's the N, interferes with old, interferes with like pulling out old information or remembering old information. Um, so a big focus of that unit is on memory, the different just ways that we remember, the different systems, the ways that we forget. And then you also, yes, um, Shrieker in the chat um, says that the acronym is porn. Yep, <laughs> that's how we use it to remember. Um, there's thinking and um, the different forms of thinking. To me, this is maybe the easiest part of the unit, convergent versus divergent, when we might use algorithms versus heuristics, and then the difference between the different types of heuristics. And then lastly is language development. And so basically the different stages that we go through, we first start by babbling, and then we have the one word stage, the two word stage, um, and then we have phonemes, morphemes, grammar, those sorts of things. Joy is asking in the chat, can you go over the different types of memory, semantic, procedural, et cetera? Yeah, so long-term memory is made up of a few different components. Um, explicit memory are things that we have to basically purposefully encode. So for example, when I'm studying for my AP Psych final, I'm like working really hard to remember and encode that information. That's more of an explicit memory. Implicit memories and implicit skills are things also called procedural memory, implicit or procedural, same thing, um, would be more skill-based usually. So that's like riding a bike. You don't have to necessarily, when you're riding a bike, think back and pull out the memory of how to do all of the different steps. It becomes implicit um, in the process. So that is the basic kind of difference between the two. So explicit is more like facts and figures, whereas implicit or procedural is more like skill-based, I would say, things that you learn well um, that aren't necessarily like things that you have to think about or remember. Um, let me look here. I've got a bunch of questions in the chat. Um, Oh, the questions just jumped up on me here. So, okay, question about availability versus representative heuristics. And they're both asking, there's two questions about that in the chat. I'm gonna just answer one of them because they're both basically the same question. So like the difference between the two. So like a representative heuristic is sort of almost like a stereotype, I guess you could say. Um, so for example, if I asked you to um, call to mind what a truck driver versus what a professor looks like. And so we do this in my class. There's like a little demo. And so like truck driver, people might say, wears flannel, has tattoos, 
wears a hat, things like that, that you might stereotypically kind of think of what a truck driver looks like. And then a professor might be wears a tweed coat, smokes a pipe, is very intelligent, things like that. And so those are kind of how we think of those different things, like a truck driver versus a professor. That's our representative example of the two. And then what happens is we let that information, kind of like our stereotype or our representative example, override the other information that's presented to us. So in the study that my students and I use, it says things like, um, it would say, in the town of Smallville, 90% of the residents are professors. Please sort the following individuals into either the professor category or the truck driver category. And so then they give you those descriptions that we talked about. Um, and you end up splitting the people who are stereotypically sounding like truck drivers into the truck driver character category and then the professors into the professor category. But what you're doing then is you're overriding the fact that it told you that 90% of the people in this town are actually professors. And so representative heuristic is basically that idea is that we're using the representative example and overriding other logical information that is presented in whatever we're talking about. And sometimes that's helpful, right? Representative heuristics um, can be useful in decision making and making judgments, but it also then can lead us to make the wrong decisions. The availability heuristic is more of what's like available fresh in our memory, what we're thinking about or what the most common um, common thing that pops to mind is. So for example, um, if I have a fear of, like if I asked you what your fears were, maybe you have a fear of swimming in the ocean because of sharks. And that's because in this case, the availability heuristic, we hear about when there's a shark attack, right? It's all over the news. It makes like national or even international news. And so you know like, oh, I better be cautious when I swim in the ocean because sharks are dangerous. However, more vending machines every year kill people than sharks do. So are you afraid of the vending machine? Like when you go to the school and you get a bottle of water, are you afraid for your life? Probably not. And so this is that it's this idea of availability heuristic of what's kind of popping into our head at that time, what's available information wise that kind of like can skew or help our judgment in certain ways. So hopefully that was helpful. Um, if that still isn't clear, Eliza, um, let me know because I that is my best example for the two. Um, other questions in the chat? Let me just scroll through here. Um, Rhea is asking a question about semantics versus syntax. And that is a little bit confusing. Um, semantics has to do with like the meaning of the words, like the definitions basically. Whereas syntax is like the order in which the words appear in the sentence to make sense. Like we put adjectives before nouns, like the red ball, the adjective goes first, right? Not the ball red. But in other languages, according to their, um, their syntax, that is the correct way to do it. And so syntax is all about the, the way the words are arranged to make sense, whereas semantics are about the words themselves and what they mean. So hopefully that makes sense. Um, I'm missing a lot of stuff that's going through in the chat right now on the side. So if you have a question that I missed, um, put it in the ask a question tab because I apologize. I can't follow everything that's happening in the right hand column while I'm reading these. Um, let me see what else is here. So for Chomsky, I see a question here. What is Chomsky's language acquisition theory? Um, I, are you asking specifically about the theory? I see that you're asking um, Chomsky's language acquisition device. I'm going to, I think you're meaning the same thing that I'm thinking of here. 
Um, basically, it's just this idea that like children, humans, have a basic predisposition to language. So Chomsky, the stuff that you need to know um, is basically the fact that he is more nature-based in his approach. So we have an innate ability to learn language. Um, all humans have that ability in theory, right? Or most humans, as long as we're exposed to the right things. Um, and that there is a certain pattern that we all go through, those sorts of things. So that is referencing what Chomsky's views on language are. Skinner, on the other hand, is the not the opposite, but he's more nurture-based, right? We learn um, from our parents, from those around us, those sorts of things. So that is the two big names that go with language, Chomsky and Skinner, that I would recommend that you know. Um, Mm -mm -mm. Max is asking a general FRQ question. This is pretty broad, but how should I prepare for FRQ questions? Um, looking at the old ones on College Board is good, but I don't know how else to prepare. That's really what I would recommend, is just familiarizing yourself with the various formats. Some of them, like we've mentioned, are research-based, so there might be charts and graphs or experiments in them. Others are the more standard, like here's a scenario apply this term, that term, and this term to it. Another common format is like, they give you a scenario and then they talk about like, how does um, how does this help someone in this scenario? And then how does this hinder or hurt someone in the following scenario? So sometimes you have to say like, oh, this would be beneficial or this would not be beneficial. Um, but really that's, that's my recommendation is, is just looking at the different types and familiarizing yourself with it. Usually there's also on the College Board website, you can access the scoring guides. So you can actually look and see like how they typically score in FRQ just to give yourself a better guess as well. And then um, the other thing I would just say is like being solid on your vocab, which is gonna help you with every part of the test. Um, but you know, there's only you know, 16-ish terms that pop up on the FRQ. So just being overall solid on knowing your vocabulary would be beneficial. Um, doo, 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 doo. Um, there's a question just asking about the most important scientists, psychologists. I'll kind of hit the ones that are important as we go through each unit here. So like, for example, we briefly just talked about Chomsky and Skinner. So, um, that's what I would say is as we go through that, I'll just kind of highlight them. So is there any other questions about cognition? Otherwise, I'm going to slide into my next topic or the next, um, the next topic on here. All right. So that was cognition. This is motivation and emotion. I'm going to give you a second to look over this slide. And I'm just going to drop the link in here because someone had asked for the link for these slides. Um, anyone on this link? Anyone with the link? Can view, save, copy link. And then I'll throw this in the chat for you guys. Oh, the computer's being slow. There you go. There's the link to these slides. All right. So motivation and emotion, another pretty big unit. Um, although I don't think there's a lot of like individual content in here. If you know the theories of motivation, so the four big things that we talk about as motivators is instinct theory, which is what it says is we do things because they're instinctual in nature. Um, Drive reduction theory, we do things because we reduce the drive that they exist upon. Optimum arousal, we do things because they bring us like this right level of like complexity and things like that. And then the hierarchy of needs, which is Maslow's idea. Um, human motivators that you should be familiar with. Um, the book talks about sex as being a motivator. Hunger and then kind of understanding what goes into hunger particularly like knowing like the hypothalamus, ventromedial and lateral, those sorts of things. And then the theories of emotion are probably to me one of the more tricky components that are on the AP test, just because the, 
they're very similar. And so differentiating between like which theory is being presented can be a little bit difficult. But the main theories, the three main theories are James Lane, Cannon Bard, and Two Factor, or um, Schachter Singer. And then there's the Zajonk and Ladeau, and I'm not sure I'm pronouncing those correctly, and Lazarus. Those are the two that I have pictured here. Um, these are kind of more, I would say, modern views of emotion. And so someone's asking specifically, I see right now, about Zajonk, Ladeau, and Lazarus. And so if you look at the pictures here on this slide, Zajonk slash Ludeau, and again, I probably am butchering the pronunciation on these, um, that there's something that happens, an event, and then Zajonk Ladeau says it immediately goes to like our response. There's an emotional response. That's things like fear or immediate like disgust or dislike of something. It's just things that would have like speedy emotional responses without any cognitive really processing. Like, yes, it goes to your thalamus, but then it routes it right out. The Lazarus um, theory instead states that we have a stimulus that goes in. It routes through our thalamus. Both of these cases, it routes through the thalamus. Um, and then we process it in our prefrontal cortex. So there is some like cognitive or function or processing that's happening there before we have the immediate response. So Zajonk Ladeau is like event response, whereas Zajonk and or whereas Lazarus says that there's some cognitive appraisal happening in there. So that's the difference. Um, some questions that have popped up. The three theories of emotion. Sure. All right. So James Lang theory of emotion is that there is some event. We'll use a bear. Like you run into a bear in the woods. We'll use that for all of the scenarios. Um, so James Lang says that there's this scary bear in the woods. You see it. And then you have a physiological response, which leads you to your emotion. So my response to seeing the bear is that my heart is going to start racing. I might start perspiring. I might start breathing heavy. That's my physiological response. That physiological response then triggers the emotion of scared or whatever, whatever the feeling is. In this case, I would think you would be scared because of the bear. Okay. So there's no cognition and other things happening. James Lang is physiological, leads to emotion. Cannon Bard, we see the scary bear. Cannon bar, there's two things that are happening. We have the physiological response and we have the emotion, but they are happening separately. James Lang says physiological leads to the emotional. Cannon Bard is discussing that there's the physiological and the emotion. They happen at the same time, but they are separate things. So in theory, with James Lang, you could have one or the other. You could have the emotion or the physiological without the other. They don't rely upon one another. Um, and then two factor is the most complex of the three. It says that we have the physiological, the heart racing, whatever, and we have cognition. We appraise the situation, which then leads us to the feeling of an emotion. Um, so that's the difference between the three. So James Lang is physiological leads to emotion. Cannon Bard is physiological and emotion at the same time, but separate. Two factor is physiological cognitive appraisal of the situation leads us to an emotion. And I'll explain that a little bit more because that is the most common one that typically shows up on the exam. For example, if you're in love, your crush walks by, what's going to happen? Your heart starts racing, right? If you encounter a bear in the woods, what's going to happen? Your heart starts racing. And so the difference is is there's got to be cognition there, right? How do I, in one situation, interpret my heartbeat racing as love because it's my crush versus in the other situation, my heart is racing and that it's fear. And so Schachter Singer says that we have that physiological and the physiological is very similar or the same, but then that cognition allows us to differentiate what it is, which then leads to the emotion, 
if that makes sense. And in the chat, I know people are talking about this, and I think there's some misinformation. I did just go over Canon Bard and, um, okay, so one more time. Canon Bard is when they're happening separately. We have the physiological response. My crush just walked into the room, and so I might, my heart might start racing, I might start perspiring, and my, my breathing gets heavy. And at the same time, when my crush walks in the room, I feel that love or that emotion. They happen together. That is, that is Canon Bard's theory, okay? All right, looks like we're good now in the chat. Hopefully that made sense. Okay, um, ventromedial and lateral hypothalamus. Good question, those are tricky. So lateral has to do with bringing on the feeling of hunger and having us start eating. And so how I tell my kids to remember this is L, lateral comes before V, ventromedial. So you have to start eating before you can stop eating. So L, lateral comes first, alphabetically and kind of in the process. And so lateral hypothalamus has to do with bringing on hunger, making you feel hungry. And then V, ventromedial, brings on the feeling of fullness and the feeling of satiety, like I'm, I'm done eating now. So that is the difference between the two. Um, L comes before V, so you have to start eating before you can stop eating. Ooh, and then I see in the chat someone says, I think about how lateral makes you fat, lat and fat can rhyme. That's actually really good. Um, Avni in the chat, I appreciate that. Um, there's a question here. Are phonemes or morphemes the smallest unit of speech? Phonemes are the smallest units of speech. They're the individual sounds that the letters or pairings of letters make. And morphemes are the smallest units of meaning in a word. Okay. Uh, do, do, do. Dara, you shared a link to like a review packet. I'm just clicking on it because I don't know what it is. It looks like it's another teacher's review. If you want to put that in the chat, you can go right ahead. Um, I haven't looked it over, so I don't know. Like, you know, it's not my packet, but you could feel free to link it if you want to, if other people are interested. Um, do, 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 do. Other questions in here? There's one question also going back to convergent versus divergent thinking. Um, convergent thinking is when we're trying to like problem solve and find the one specific answer. Think of like how if something converges, it comes to like one point. Whereas divergent thinking, you know, if things are separating, we're just trying to be creative and think of as like many solutions to a problem as possible. Um, yeah. All right. I think... It, I think I've got all the questions in here that people posted in the ask a question tab. So, like I said, to me, the trickiest part is the theories of motion, just because in the question, they're, they're really similar, right? They deal with physiological, they deal with emotion. Um, so I would just make sure you really understand those small differences between them that we talked about. Um, yeah, I don't think there's anything else. Oh, there's a new question in here. Okay, yeah, this links back to the cognition unit, primacy versus recency effect. So this has to do with like remembering information and like processing that sort of thing. So basically, we remember things that are either first in a list or towards the end of a list, but we often forget the middle stuff, the in-between. Um, the reason that we remember the first stuff is because it's the first things that we're processing and that we're encoding. That's the primacy effect, first, primary, that sort of thing. So if I gave you a list of 30 words to remember, you would typically um, do better with that, the first five or so words on that list. Primacy effect. Recency effect then states that we'll also remember better the last five or so things on the left on the list because those are the most recent in my memory. So
So you remember the first and you remember the last. And then we often forget the middle in between stuff. So that's what those effects are referring to. Um, doo -doo -doo, drive reduction theory example. So drive reduction just says that like I have a need that needs to be met. I'm thirsty. And so my behavior to reduce that need of thirst so what happens is I'm thirsty. That thirst is my drive. My need is water. And so to reduce that drive, what am I going to do? I'm going to get a glass of water. Um, that sort of thing, basically. So we do things. I eat food to reduce that drive of needing that food. Um, I'm seeing some stuff about optimum arousal in the chat, so I would like to talk about that just to make sure um, that we're all on the same page with that. Optimum arousal has to do with the fact that a lot of these theories don't explain all of human behavior. So like, why did we put a man on the moon? That's not explained by drive reduction. That's not explained by instinct. And so basically, why else do humans, are humans motivated to do certain things? And so what optimum arousal says is that when our like basic needs are met, like the food, the thirst, that sort of thing, shelter, that humans thrive off of having some sort of arousal, right? Like if we don't have enough arousal, we're just kind of a little bored sitting there. If we have too much arousal, we're like stressed and freaking out. And so the optimum arousal theory states that as humans, we look to, or other motivations can be explained by like having that little bit of arousal, that like drive forward, that push to do other things. And so we have to find that sweet spot kind of in our lives, whether that's, you know, playing a sport and, and practicing that or being really good at an instrument. But that that feeling of finding that like sweet spot of being challenged, but not like too greatly challenged is um, kind of what that theory is stating. Bunch more questions in here. You just did the optimum arousal. Um, I'm seeing people talking about FRQs. I will try to get to one or two at the end. And then I see some people talking about like parts of the brain and stuff. Um, I can link you back to the other reviews. Um, but I don't want to spend a ton of time talking about things that we've talked about on previous days. Because um, I want to make sure I get to all of the new um, information. And hyperopia, someone's asking about like nearsightedness and farsightedness. Hyperopia is farsightedness and myopia is nearsightedness. Um, I don't really think you need to know that for the AP test. I don't teach my students that um, a whole lot, but basically that's what it is. It's farsightedness um, and nearsightedness. Okay, um, here's what I will do. I will do, let's see, it's 12.35. I'm going to do one more um, unit at least. And then um, we will talk about some FRQs at the end. I'll spend the last 10 minutes doing the last, like doing an FRQ, okay? So that is what we will do. Um, someone's asking about the appraisal event and the emotional response. Basically, the appraisal event is just whatever's happening. Um, and then the emotional response is based on, depending whose theory that you're talking about, is garnered from the physiological and the cognition that goes into it. Um, okay. And then, yep, I'm seeing a question about an incentive. An incentive is just something in the environment that pushes you towards that drive. So if I'm feeling a little bit hungry, that might not be enough hunger to push me to reduce that drive by going to eat. But if I'm feeling a little bit hungry and my mom's baking cookies, that smell of those cookies could be an incentive that further pushes me in that drive towards that specific thing. Okay. Da, da, da. Okay. I'm going to move on to the next topic, which is 
development. We have not talked about development. Development has a lot of theories in it. And so while you are taking a second to look this over, I'm going to talk through it. I'm going to also link my last two um, my last two review units so that you guys can access those slides. Because like I said, I'm seeing people talking about um, like the eye and I saw some stuff about neurotransmitters. And so that stuff is stuff we've already talked about. So I will link you to those slides and you could look those over on your own. But for development, you have to know just the basic newborn process, like how babies are formed. You don't have to know a ton of the like scientific stuff behind it, but you do at least need to know the basic stages. Um, you need to know Piaget and how he deals with cognition and the different stages that he lays out. You need to know like about kind of social well-being and attachment and how that goes in with like Harlow and with Mary Ainsworth. You need to familiarize yourself with Eric Erickson's stages, um, which have to do with social, emotional kind of growth and development. And then lastly, Kohlberg, which deals with moral development. So you need to know all of those and their kind of stages that go into them. Um, in particular, I'm still looking for the links right now. In particular, um, probably I would say Piaget pops up a lot on the AP test. So familiarizing yourself with Piaget would be good. And then, um, yeah, do, do, do. here we go. Here, I'm going to link this one, get share of the link. Sorry, this is taking a second. My drive is like packed full of resources here. Ugh. Okay. Why is it not working? My drive is frozen now, of course. Here we go. Let me refresh it. Hmm, sorry. Do you guys have any questions in particular about development? Put it in the ask a question tab because I will be there in two seconds once I get this link posted. Those are my slides from two times ago. And then this should be my slides from last session. There we go. Um, so those are the slides. Oh, holy cow, a bunch of questions just popped up. Um, yep, so Colbert. So Kohlberg's theory of moral, oops, Kohlberg's theory of moral development has three main stages. I know that some people teach it in like, there's like multiple stages, but I would say you really just need to know the three basic ones. That's how I teach it. And Kohlberg would say that um, moral development isn't necessarily tied to an age. So it's not like some of the other ones where around age two to age five, you're doing this or that. But um, he would say that it's it's a little bit separated from age. But yes, like little kids tend to be at the earliest stage and so on and so forth. So Kohlberg would say that the pre-conventional, that's the first stage of moral development. And basically that just says that we do things to avoid getting punished or to gain the rewards from them. Um, and so if we if we use the Heinz dilemma, which is the one where the guy talks about um, should he steal a life-saving medicine for his wife with cancer? So if you're at the pre-conventional stage, it's like, I'm not going to steal the drug because I don't want to get in trouble. I don't want to go to jail. It's all about you. That's the pre-conventional stage. And the thing with Colbert is it doesn't really matter what state, like what your decision is, because you could choose either way. It's why you're making the decision. Because in Kohlberg's stage at the pre-conventional level, you could also choose to steal the medicine. And your reasoning would be that because I don't want my wife to die. I don't want to live without my wife. And so both of those reasons are more internal, more selfish. They're focused on you. Um, and then the second stage of Kohlberg's moral ladder is the conventional stage. And in that stage, we make decisions for like, so society looks upon us in a good way. So for example, using that same dilemma, I'm not going to steal the medicine for my wife because society will call me a thief. 
or I'm going to steal the medicine for my wife because then everyone's going to think what an awesome husband I am. I'm going to look like a really good guy because I, I did something risky to save my wife's life. And so it's about how like society views you and like the rules and views of society. And then the final stage is the post-conventional stage. And this is when at this point you've created your own sort of moral code and your own sort of beliefs about what is truly right and truly wrong. And so for that stage, Kohlberg would maybe say something like, um, I'm not going to steal the medicine because taking something that isn't yours is never right. And so I shouldn't steal it. Or you could say, of course I'll steal the medicine because someone's life is more important than someone's property. And so those are like transcendent kind of reasoning and that's that post-conventional stage of development. So those are the three main stages that you should know about. Um, yeah. Let me see, there's a ton of questions in here. Um, Okay, so I see people asking about newborn reflexes. So there's the rooting reflex, which is when, you know, if you like touch an infant's cheek, then they would turn their head to face the like, whatever it is. And that's so that they can find the nipple or the bottle when they're eating. Um, the Babinski rough reflex is the foot one where if you like stroke a baby's foot and then it goes like doop, like kind of curls outward like that um that one has to do with possibly in theory having to like i'm not really sure um like why it happens i don't think you really need to concern yourself with why it happens more or less they might ask you about this. You might just have to identify it. That's the Babinski is the foot one. And then the Morrow reflex is like the startle one where if you like, you're not gonna drop the baby, but if you kind of lift them a little bit and then let them go, again, you're not dropping them, but they just kind of like put their hands back to like kind of block themselves a little bit. Um, those are the couple of main ones that I can think of off the top of my head. Um, I would say that's not super typical that they ask about them. So just kind of being able to know what they are um, would be good. And someone's just asking, okay, we did the Babinski briefly. Peer influence. Yeah, the gist of peer influence is just that like at our age, at your age, not our age, sorry. Um, peer influence plays a role, particularly in things with like how we dress, how we talk, things like that. But parental influence is also important um, in regards to more like permanent things, like often our religious views, our political views, those are more influenced by our parents, um, things like that, yeah. Okay, um, other questions? So it looks like there is a question about research with about test standardization. Since I did skip over the testing unit, I will answer that one. Um, so Dana is asking about test standardization. Basically, it just is talking about this idea that like for a test to be administered, like the AP exam to all of you guys, we have to have certain procedures in place to make sure that everyone's getting the same sort of environment, the same sort of test, that sort of thing. I think that's what you're asking. Um, and so we have to put those procedures in place. Okay, and I saw something about Vygotsky and it's I lost it in here now. I'm gonna come back to it. Okay, yep, up here. So I think a lot of people are confused about what Vygotsky's theory is. And so Vygotsky, really, you just need to know that he talks about this idea of the zone of proximal development. 
and also this idea of like scaffolding. And so it's these ideas that like kids or anyone learning something has to kind of go through these steps to build their way up to it. And so first you can't do it, then you can do it um, with guidance. So that's kind of the scaffolding, right? Someone's helping you to do this thing. And then eventually you can do it on your own. And so it's just a theory of how we like learn to do things basically. And it's focused on this idea of like building up towards it. We don't just automatically learn something. It takes like steps or a process to get there. Um, and then Erickson's ideas. So Erickson has those different stage theories like um, identity versus role confusion, that sort of thing. And so for Erickson, I would say the, the most commonly asked about one is probably the identity versus role confusion. Um, so for example, that's your stage and that's why it's most commonly asked about. Um, I would say that's the most important one. But basically what Erickson would say is that at each stage of our life, there's this conflict that needs to be resolved. And we either revolve, resolve that conflict and so we become competent and able in whatever that area is, or that then presents itself as a problem for us later in life because we didn't become competent at whatever that thing is. So for example, you guys are at the stage of creating an identity or having role confusion. And so we would love for you, like the goal is that if you develop properly, um, that in the next five or so years, you guys will have a stable identity. You will be able to answer the question who I am. Um, but if you don't, you may like go through life and you might you know, not be able to choose a major in college. You might not be able to settle into a career because you haven't found that identity yet of who you are. And so that's what Erickson is getting at with his stages is just that we have to like overcome this conflict at each stage in life um, to become like the best person or like a, a competent person. Um, other questions in here is Ainsworth studies. Um, Ainsworth did the strange situation. And so Ainsworth talks about this idea that like we want to have a healthy attachment or like a secure attachment to whoever we're caregiving for. And so she did the study where like a parent would leave the room and then we would watch how the child reacts when the parent returns. And so um, they found that like obviously babies who have insecure attachment later on um, have more like concerns or more issues than those with insecure attachment. Uh, or no, we want secure attachment. I think I said that backwards. And so babies with secure attachment are more confident. They're more easy to comfort. They've been basically like cared for in the right way sort of idea. And then Baumrind has to do with parenting styles. So I would say that they're not super, like they're similar because they're talking about parents. But Mary Ainsworth's talking about attachment and how the child feels attachment to the parent, whereas Baumrind is dealing with like how we parent. And so Baumrind identified um, four parenting styles. And then we've come to the conclusion that the authoritative, which is the like demanding but caring parenting style leads to the best outcomes in development. Um, and then there's Piaget's stages and his deal with cognitive development. And so we have the sensory motor stage, which is the initial stage where babies are interpreting the world basically through their sensory and motor skills, that sort of idea. The second stage deals with pre-operational thinking. This is all cognitive development. Um, and it has to do with like babies are first starting to like put words and meanings together. Um, but they're still really kind of self-centered and self-focused. They can't like hypothetically think yet or things like that. And then the third stage is concrete operational. This is when kids are really logical. They can start to do basic math skills with conservation and transformation, um, but they still don't have this like abstract hypothetical reasoning yet. And then the final stage is formal operational, which is that like 
last stage of development that we get into where we can hypothetically reason, we can think abstractly about problems and things like that. So those are Piaget's stages. Um, so it looks like we're going to get to the FRQ right about now, but I'm just double checking the questions here. Um, Elena just briefly asked if there's any more live streams coming up. There are, there's a stream every night this week, but they are for fiveable members. So you would have to do the paid membership. I believe it's $5 at this point, which is a pretty good deal for three nights of review. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay. I'm not going to get to the abnormal stuff. So Louisa, I will answer your question here. Positive symptoms of schizophrenia versus negative symptoms. So positive again, does not mean good or bad. It just means like positive is adding something in. So positive symptoms of schizophrenia would be things like having hallucinations or delusions. Those are like symptoms that you normally wouldn't have, but schizophrenia adds them in. And then negative symptoms is when you minus, subtract, or are missing like normal behaviors, I guess, with schizophrenia. So that would be things like flat affect, being lethargic, so you don't have the, the, the right emotional reactions and things like that. So those are the positive and negative symptoms. And then someone's asking about Freud's sexual, psychosexual stages. Since we didn't get to that either, I will quickly give you an acronym to help you remember that. Um, for Freud's psychosexual stages, I use the acronym Only Awesome People Learn Guitar. And so O goes with the first stage, which is oral. And I actually have a slide for this, so I'll actually just put the slide up. So the psychosexual stages, O, stands for oral and that kind of goes with this idea that like right babies derive pleasure from the mouth because that's how they eat right awesome deals with anal which means that that's when babies are like learning to be potty trained and go to the bathroom and they're on their own so they derive like pleasure from learning that skill p people deals with phallic l learning is latent meaning it's like hidden or not there and then g guitar is um genital sorry i blinked for a second which is then when we reach like sexual maturity so i would just say yeah only awesome people learn guitar might be a helpful acronym all right um mm -mm -mm. so i am going to bring up an FRQ here. Let me see what we can do. Can you guys tell me, I think that you can see this if I open a new tab here. Mm, released FRQ. So you've got about seven minutes. I'll just show you a couple different kinds of FRQs and then we can talk through them. Um, I'm not gonna probably answer any at this point, but I can at least, you guys can see that, right? It says like AP psychology, okay, good. Um, all right, so you guys have access to this, I believe, it's on the College Board website because these are all released exams. If you scroll down, you can see all the FRQs from all the different years. And so for example, Sorry, my computer's being slow. Okay, so now you can't see the FRQ that I just downloaded, can you? I need to share my screen in a different way. Hmm. Oh, that's not what we want. Here we go. So here's the 2018 FRQ. I'm going to blow it up. Hopefully that is readable. This is what it looks like. This is just one of the FRQs. 
And so basically, this is one of the ones I mentioned before. It's a help or hinder scenario. Um, and so the question is really brief. It just says, Jackie has been chosen for the role in the school play. She's both nervous and excited. And then it gives you further instructions. Part A asks you to talk about how these terms might help her remember or might help her perform better in the play. And then part B asks her, asks how these terms might hinder um, her in the play. And this is a pretty common scenario. It's like help or hurt. So we talked about this. Um, and then I'm just going to give you a second to look at it and read it and then see if there's any other questions that we can go to here. And so for any FRQ, the approach that I would take is I always just start with the definition because sometimes you need the definition to score. So even if it doesn't require it, you know, sometimes it does require it. So I want to make sure that you do the definition. So for every, every FRQ, I would go through and first just define the term when you start with it. Um, so on here, context-dependent memory is first. So when I'm writing out my FRQ, remember you want to use pen. You don't want to use pencil. That's another thing. Um, and you want to devote your own space to each of the terms. So you just start with this and you would say context dependent memory. Um, and so I would say something like context dependent memory is my increased ability to remember or recall information when it is encoded and recalled in the same environment or something like that. And so um, that's the definition, basic definition. You should avoid using the same word. So like try not to use memory and things like that um, in your definition. And then this is how you really score the points is applying it to the scenario. So they want to know how this would help her. So for the help category, you would say something like, Jackie could use this to her advantage if she studied her lines in the theater where she would perform the play. Therefore, the context of where she learned the information would help improve her memory during the performance, something like that. So knowing that we recall information better where we learn it, then maybe you should study your acting lines in the theater because that will then help you remember the information. Something like that would be how you could answer that question. And so um, that is Basically, you don't have to write that much. That was like three sentences, right? The other thing then about um, the FRQ is you should leave a space. I always tell my students leave a space between paragraphs. So now that I'm done talking about context-dependent memory, I would skip a line and then start talking about acetylcholine. So acetylcholine is dot, 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 dot. It would help her because dot, 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 dot. Skip another line. Kinesthetic sense is that da 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 da. This would help her because that da 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 da. So make sure you space out your your terms as well. And if you come up on an FRQ and you're like, oh, I have zero idea what acetylcholine is, then skip it because you get 50 minutes. And I always tell my students you want to spend your time on the ones you feel confident about. So I would skip a few lines, leave some space, maybe write down acetylcholine. But don't, don't waste your time on it. Go to the ones that you feel confident about. And no, Jamie, I wouldn't write it in bullet form. You need to write complete sentences. But I would leave it in like little, in little paragraph chunks so that each term has its own paragraph. This is just stuff that helps the person who's reading it or grading it later on do a better job. I also always underline the term when I use it. So like acetylcholine, I would always underline it just because you want to draw as much attention to the term as possible to make sure that it's not missed in scoring. And so you've got this FRQ, then you do the next one. The next one is research-based. I'll stay on a little bit after one o'clock just to show you this second FRQ. I think this one is research-based, yeah. So this is an example of what a research-based FRQ might look like, a statistical one. So the question is still short. It says a survey was conducted 
to determine the state um, of physical and psychological health of high school students. Part A gives you a visual and it asks you to use the visual in your questions. And I would say, yes, you wanna bring a pen and a pencil to the exam. The minimum in FRQ should be two sentences because you have to define the term and you have to apply the term. So that's like minimum two sentences. But I would say, you know, three or four might be better if you're gonna do a thorough like connection or application. Um, all right, so this one is a little bit different because instead of bullet pointed individual terms, it's bullet pointed questions. You are still going to answer it in the same way. It just looks a little bit different. So this is what I'm talking about, about like familiarizing yourself with um, different formats. Because if you saw this and didn't expect it, it might be a little bit scary. But um, this is just another example of what one can look like. So the first question says, the first bullet point says, what is the most appropriate conclusion that can be drawn on the figure above? And so you would have to talk about stress being correlated with illness, basically. You could say that there's a strong positive correlation between stress and number of absences due to illness. Um, yeah. And then part B of this question goes into the more traditional approach of what you see in an FRQ. I've also seen FRQs that have to do with um, creating your own experiment. Those are tricky, but they're not that common. Um, someone's asking about scoring in the chat. Um, I t if you're trying to get a five, I would say that you want to be in like the A high 70s, low 80s for multiple choice, and then probably getting about half of the, half-ish of the FRQ correct. Um, I can't tell you for sure because the scores vary every year based on like the averages and things like that. But typically speaking, that would get you a five. Um, any other, I'm just gonna look in the chat one last time. It doesn't look like there's any new questions. Um, yeah, and the FRQ is super random. I don't really know. It just, that's how it is. And so those 10 to 15 or those 15-ish terms that pop up tend to be pretty important. So I don't know. Um, yeah, I don't really have an answer for that. Um, Shrieker, I would say, yeah, just an 80 on that. You can do a score calculator and find out, but it really depends. The average um the average on the multiple choice or i'm sorry the average on the frq is usually below a 50 percent so for example if we go oh yuck uh, <laughs> if we look at the scoring distribution here from this one um this will show you just an idea of the difficulty for scoring Nope, that's not what I wanted. Wait, that is what I wanted. Sorry, I'm having trouble with my screens here. This one, da, 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 here. So this is the scoring breakdown from the 2018 exam that you were just looking at the FRQ from. Um, this is the percentage of people, I guess, that get the scores. Hold on, I'm trying to find this. This is what I was looking for. Scoring statistics show you what each person got. Um, bum, bum, bum. Maybe, maybe not. Sorry, my computer's taking a while to open these documents. There we go. So on question one of the FRQ that you were just looking at, the mean was 3.28 out of how many terms were there? Um, I think there was seven, seven terms, yeah. So it's below a 50%. So, and then question two is even harder, 2.88 was the mean. So for the FRQs, like if you're hitting like a 50% on them, you're actually really doing um, a pretty good job. Um, that's what I would say. So if you get at least a 50% or higher on the FRQ and then aim for like an 80s, 
in the multiple choice, that's probably a five. Um, I tell my students, if you want to be confident in getting like a three, you should aim for like trying to get up to like 70s, low 70s in the multiple choice, and then, you know, trying to get as much of the FRQ as possible. All right, I am going to log off in a second. Um, like I said, this is the last free session. There is another one tonight with a different teacher. I think she's specifically reviewing research methods. So that would be helpful because, like I said, they tend to focus on that on FRQs. No guarantee, but that does happen. Um, and then this is all found on Shrieker on the College Board website. So I don't have the link super here. I guess I could just send you the link. Let me see. Um, here's the link to this, and you guys have access to that stuff. So, um, last free session, but like I said, it's like five bucks to join for the next three days. Then you'll get next time we're just doing multiple choice. So we're just going to do a ton of multiple choice questions and talk through them on Tuesday. We're going to do just FRQs. So we'll do some actual practice of FRQs. We'll look at some more examples. We'll talk through the scoring of them. And then Wednesday night is any like last minute questions that you guys have. So if you subscribe, um, I'll just be here. I won't have anything like specific to review, but we'll just talk through any questions or things that you're worried about. So yeah, hopefully this was helpful. Um, I did put the links from the previous sessions in the chat, Dara. So if you scroll back, you should be able to find them um, in there. They are there. So all right, I'm going to log off then for the night, day, night, whatever. Um, and I will hopefully see most of you guys on Monday when we come back live.